Hey there, Emma. Hi. Hey, uh, and hello everybody that's tuning in. Uh, my name is Adam Davis and I'm here with Emma Green. Uh, Emma, you're calling in from New York? That's right. All right, well, thank you for the time change and all of that. Uh, I'm calling in from uh, downtown Portland, Oregon uh, with Oregon Humanities. Uh, this is a Consider This program and it's right in between yesterday's Martin Luther King Day, or I should say Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Day and tomorrow's Inauguration Day. And that's why we're especially excited to have you here. You've been writing and thinking about religion and politics for a while now, things we're not supposed to talk about. <laughs> that's right. I always say that I make the worst or the best party guest, depending on your perspective. All right. Well, uh, let's hope everybody comes down on the right side of that uh, this evening. Um, let me say a, a little bit of thanks to some organizations that made this possible for Oregon Humanities to put on. Then we'll jump into conversation for about an hour. And then I want to encourage everybody to rejoin breakout group conversations afterward through the link that should be below the video and was also sent out before if you registered so that you can get in on that Zoom call. Um, I wanna say a big thanks to the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Oregon Cultural Trust, Northwest Natural, Tonkin Torp, Stoll Reeves, the Kinsman Foundation and the City of Portland's We Are Better Together program. And especially I wanna say thanks to the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, which funds a program called Why It Matters, Civic and Electoral Participation, an initiative that is administered by the Federation of State Humanities Councils. And lastly, to the Oregon League of Women Voters for co-sponsoring this. So just a big, huge thanks to all of those organizations and the people there that have made this possible and lots of other events. Emma, for the last few months and for the next few months, we're trying to do a lot of thinking through Consider This programs and other programs about democracy, engagement, uh, democratic engagement, justice, um, and we haven't talked explicitly about religion yet, which is now that I think about it a little bit unfathomable. And I'm really glad we're going to get to dive in tonight. And I wanted to start by, again, with Martin Luther King in mind and with tomorrow in mind. Tomorrow, we're going to hear, no doubt, at the end of at least one speech, we're going to hear the phrase, God bless America, or something like that. And I guess given that you've been thinking about this stuff for so long, what do you hear when speeches end with that phrase? <laughs> what a big question to start with. And I should also offer my own thanks for Oregon Humanities having me here. I'm so excited about this conversation and was really just thrilled by the premise that you all are convening these conversations to talk about this tough moment that we're in, in our democracy. And my work very much focuses on that big picture question. How does religion, belief, values fit into this forward looking question about how we're gonna be able to move forward as a, a political entity. Mm -hmm. God bless America is a ubiquitous part of American political life. And it's what you might call a part of American civic religion. This idea that uh, we as a country are from all different kinds of faiths and, and creeds, um, but we have a sort of civil religion that uh, unites us together with a general set of beliefs about a higher power, certain principles that we hold to, certain truths that we hold to be self-evident. And even though we are in a religious demographic reality where more and more Americans actually aren't affiliated with any particular type of religious group, don't go to church or to synagogue or mosque on a regular basis and maybe have ambiguous feelings about their relationship to a higher power. It's just expected in American life that our politicians are going to use phrases like that, one nation under God, God bless America. Um, I think Joe Biden in particular is a really interesting figure when it comes to this kind of civil religion because he is deep within that tradition. On the campaign trail running for president, he very much drew on his Catholic faith, 
talking about how that motivated him through really rough times in his life, through periods of grief, and also how that brought some of his core values around healthcare, uh, thinking about the role of government and justice, um, looking to nuns as some of his favorite people who bring inspiration to him. So I think with Joe Biden, it's not just that civil religion, although definitely that's a part of it. I think it's also authentic to who he is as a politician. And certainly as a religion reporter, that's something I'm looking out for as we watch him become president. So don't want to get too much yet into really Biden or even Trump yet. There's no way we can't think about both of them. I guess I want to stick with, you've used the phrase civil religion a couple times already. And that actually reminds me of political philosophy I studied you know, a while ago. And uh, people who talked often about the use of religion in civic contexts. And you know we hear the phrase separation of church and state a lot. Um, but it, what you just suggested is that's not, that's not a thing. Like people constantly draw on religious faith. It's not only something they do, it's something that's expected. Uh, the, first of all, I guess I just wanna ask, does that seem like, are these two things so enmeshed that they can't be separated or is there a way to separate them? And now I'm starting to think about the question of identity, like how we identify. So. Yeah, go ahead. I think the identity frame is a really, really powerful one. So this idea of a civil religion, it's almost a way of thinking about how to knit together a country of radically different people who have radically different beliefs, still with the same set of symbols and language and values, a sort of common forum that we can come together in. And when scholars talk about civil religion, that certainly is not my idea. I don't want to pass that off as a phrase that I came up with. And when they talk about that idea, they're talking about, you know, language that's drawn from Christianity, you know, talking generally about a monotheistic God, but also some of these ideas of democracy and nation. It's sort of this shared forum that we can enter into together. And I think one of the aspects of this moment that I'm thinking about a lot is the loss of that shared language. This idea that we don't have a common space to enter into anymore. It seems like it's harder and harder to enter into that space where we can kind of agree, okay, we may be different. We may have different views on policy or different votes that we would cast on our ballot, but ultimately we're coming together and kind of agree about the basic principles of who we are. And um, I think that is a hard place to be as a country. Because I think when you can't agree on the basic principles of identity as a nation, values looking forward, and language to talk about the problems that face us, it's really hard to do anything. And I think some of the chaotic nature of Washington that we've been seeing, especially over the last few weeks, is certainly not just a result of that, but I think that's one of the causes. So it's interesting to think about this idea I mean, I think we're hearing from many places that we've lost this shared language and also shared sense of values. And then I think the question, the first question that comes to mind for me is, uh, you, I think usually we're talking about that in a political sense, and then you see it culturally too. I guess I heard in your comment that religion maybe used to provide some of that and doesn't anymore which surprised me that you were implying that. So first, let me clarify, is that what you're suggesting that religion, even in this pluralistic religious country used to be one of the things that provided shared language and shared values, but now that's drifting further apart? I think that's certainly part of it. So generally speaking, we don't know exactly how religious America has been throughout all of its history because we didn't have polls back in 1776 and mm -hmm. we didn't have the same kind of social scientific tools. But when we look at the information we do have about that arc of American religiosity, we see that taking, for example, from the 1950s to today, the kinds of activities that would have been a common default in American communities are no longer taken for granted. Um, there's significant more, significantly more religious diversity, but also in terms of you know, people going to church because it was the obligatory expected communal activity, people getting a basic education 
uh, from their Catholic school or from their evangelical pastor. And um, all of these kinds of default settings for American society that used to kind of rest in a sort of, you know, Christianity that everybody imbibed, even if they were Jewish or Muslim, you know, they all kind of imbibed this language. That's not even a sort of basic language that people start from or speak from or want to engage in anymore. But I, I think it's even more than that. I think it's that um, that set of default, default settings going away has also coincided with a kind of pulling apart of a national identity. This idea that Christianity aside, whatever you want to call it, we don't even share some of the basic premises about what it means to be a nation, one nation together under God, whatever that means. We don't even share the basic premises about what it means to operate in a pluralistic democracy. And one could argue that we never really shared those things, that there was never really a space where everyone was willing to come together and kumbaya, you know, yeah. do the hard work of politics in a statesmanlike way. That was always a fiction. But um, I think these sort of separate realities and separate languages that um, different groups in America live in, um, particularly in politics, make it really, really hard to uh, sort of look across to the other side and have any kind of understanding of what's going through those people's minds. I think a couple of things you said there. One, thinking back and, I mean, and back to King again, King saying the most segregated time in the United States is Sunday morning. And so maybe shared values, but in, in very different places. And and where there was another group that seemed primary, like, okay, yes, we're all going to church, but we're going with people who are like us racially. Um, so what I wanna ask there by thinking about that is to what we're, what we're looking back to, what we feel right now is because you've been thinking about these two things together, that is political affiliation and religious affiliation, do you see one of those as being uh, more strongly determinative of who we are? Do we identify more strongly as either this politically or religiously? Mm. Yeah, it's such a great question. And it's one that I've done some reporting on, um, talking to scholars, social scientific, looking at social scientific research. One of the things that's emerged among political scientists, especially trying to understand what partisanship looks like in the United States today, is this theory that um, partisanship has kind of become king of American identity. Certainly there are exceptions, people who would describe themselves as you know, Jewish before they're a Democrat, evangelical before they're a Republican, you know, Christian before they're conservative, whatever it might be. Um, and a lot of people might talk about themselves that way. And there are lots of indicators that the great sort that we see happening in so many aspects of American life really is happening along partisan lines. Political scientists have found that, for example, Republicans and Democrats are likely to drive different kinds of cars and listen to different kinds of music. Um, their favorite television shows tend to sort out by partisan affiliation. Um, there was one study that I saw that even suggested that kids' names, the types of kids' names that Republicans and Democrats choose are different. Mm -hmm. um, all of this to me is so interesting because it's not just I have a different view on climate change than this Republican, or I have a different view on abortion than this Democrat, these sort of hard policy issues that divide us. It's actually the way that we're consuming culture, the things that we like, our tastes, who we surround ourselves with, the friends we pick out, the preschools that we send our children to. And that to me is just so potent because it suggests that for people who are really enmeshed in those, those networks and circles, there's very little way to shake yourself out of that. That's, it's really all consuming. But it's interesting to think that politics might have a deeper hold on us than say faith, which is what it sounds like you're suggesting, not that these studies you've looked at are suggesting as well, but politics, not because it's simply those policy positions, but because politics is so hard to separate from a whole set of other ways of living daily in the world. So maybe, maybe I can push a little bit here. Um, I'm gonna caricature both politics and religion maybe for a minute. And that is to think like, especially democratic politics, that 
that the call, the religious call, the call of faith, seems like it's a deep authoritative call. Sort of, this is the voice to listen to. The call of democratic politics seems to be a little bit like there's a whole bunch of voices out here. We think it's good for them all to be in play. Therefore, we're going to commit on an intellectual level to that. So how is it that something like that less authoritative call could displace the, uh, the more authoritative call of faith? That's a really big question. Um, so I'd offer a few thoughts. I think first, this question that you brought up of identity and the way that our sense of who we are informs our choices um, and how we present ourselves is really, really powerful. And when you're talking about not just what are the big principles that I believe? What do I believe about life, death, and the meaning of existence, which mm -hmm. you might say is the province of religion for a lot of people, but also who are my people, right? Who's my tribe? I think there's a lot of evidence that for many people in America, that tribe question is increasingly political. Mm -hmm. And I think that goes back to all the things I was talking about, the way that we sort of sort ourselves and live our lives based on these partisan factors that sort of put us in these different buckets. Um, one of my favorite um, research stats or study stats, the Atlantic did a partnership with the Public uh, Religion Research Institute and re-asked a question that had been asked in a 1950s study, um, which was asking parents to say whether or not they would be upset if their child married someone of the opposite political party. Uh -huh. And compared to the 1950s, I can't remember the numbers quite off the top of my head. I think it was something like a quarter of Republicans and 35% of Democrats, something like that. But compared to the 1950s, that had really gone up. And that's a lot of people saying, you know, I don't care if they're Muslim or Sikh or Jewish or Christian or Catholic, whatever. I don't care if they're an atheist. But if you marry a Republican, you're out. That's the end. Um, to me, that's a really powerful illustration of this idea of this is who we are and this is who we're not. And you can bring anybody into who we are, but we're drawing a hard boundary around politics. Um, so I, I do think that is, is a really big frame. And, and certainly for some people, religion is tribe. Um, but I think the other part of it is that religion has become intermingled with political identity, both on the left and the right. Um, and I think on the left, that's often um, for people of no religion, of no faith or of no affiliation, often sort of politics comes to take some of those functions in space. Um, I think on the right, you see a lot of religious groups that are very intermingled with political identity. Um, so yes, religion also might be that sense of tribe, but I think politics also seeps in there. That, you know, that's funny because that sounds to me maybe this is idiosyncratic, but it sounds kind of hopeful, even though what you're describing feels like something we lament all the time. But what feels hopeful to me about it is uh, it feels like politics is or could be less of a given. Mm. That is political identity seems like something that has less to do with where you're born and what you inherit and is something that you could say, well, this is where this is a set of values that I have and therefore I'm going to vote in this way. That doesn't seem like how it shakes out. I mean, there's geography that suggests we identify politically the way we root for sports teams, but, but in a way it would seem like great if we can decide what, where we want to be politically, it seems kind of fluid mm. in a hopeful way, which again, surprises me to hear because the way things feel now is like they're actually getting less and less, changeable and more and more rooted in other factors. Can I, maybe I wanna push from this to the, a piece of yours quite recent, January 8th, you wrote a piece for the Atlantic titled, A Christian Insurrection, which puts politics and religion squarely together. And so can I just ask about that as an example of what we're talking about? How was that, uh, not a political insurrection first and foremost, but a Christian insurrection. So this piece is focused on the attack on the Capitol that happened on January 6th. And I noticed like a lot of people noticed that many of those who were protesting and also those who ended up breaching the Capitol invoked 
Christian imagery. They mm-hmm. were marching under banners that literally bore the name of Jesus. They carried giant wooden crosses. They invoked religious language. They would shout things like, you know, clap if you love Jesus, clap if you love Trump, right? And there was a lot of language of prayer, the sense that there was a holy mission behind what they were doing, either in protesting or in breaching the Capitol. And indeed, some of the organizers of the various marches that ended up joining together to be both the protesters who were on the National Mall and outside the Capitol, but also some of those who went into the Capitol, um, at least some of them were explicitly religious. I followed one group called the Jericho March, which was organized by two people who are relatively unknown in the organized Christian world, but got together some firepower from organized organizations and some bigger name preachers and were able to bring together people both in DC, but also state capitals to explicitly call on God to intervene and make sure that Trump was inaugurated for his second term. And this to me was just such a moment to stop and think about what has both Christianity become in the United States, a a specific kind of Christianity, Mm -hmm. conservative Christianity that often is referred to as white evangelical Protestantism, but also in this case included a ton of Catholics, people who are part of charismatic and Pentecostal Christian traditions, a sort of whole grab bag of people who are part of this Christian banner that sort of Trump uh, forward Christianity or or Trump oriented Christianity. Um, But it was also a really powerful moment to reflect on who has taken the microphone to be able to define what Christianity is in the public sphere. Um, You know, when I talk to people who aren't Christian and don't spend a lot of time in churches, whenever I bring up evangelicals or any kind of Christianity, the number one thing they ask about is Trump, 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 Trump. Why is it that these people have supported Trump? And it was just really striking to me to realize that for all of the diversity that there is in American Christianity, uh, Catholicism, evangelicalism, the main line, I mean, this is a huge swath of people with an enormous amount of diversity of all kinds. Mm -hmm. It's really become defined as this imagery of people taking a cross to the Capitol to contest the results of an election. And I just think that's so powerful and kind of stunning. Yeah, stunning for a lot of reasons, um, including taking a cross to the Capitol, just like, again, back to the church state connection. So, I mean, I, so there are times in this country, in addition to God bless America and other times when religion is invoked in political spheres really clearly. I mean, Lincoln at one point declaring a, a national fast day for, which is kind of just an incredible fusing of these things together. Uh, I, I do want to ask about, there are a couple things in what you just said that feel so, again, potentially hopeful and also worrisome. Um, the diversity and the power of the church in this country. And that I don't mean a unified church. I mean, religious institutions that as a sort of organizing network, there's just this amazing way that that shapes so much of what goes on. How does it happen that in your view, that kind of unity across denominations uh, emerges around a figure who six years ago probably was not central to the church, said Broad. How, how does that happen? And is it that, that Trump grabbed the microphone or that it was already moving that way and he just happened to be the right guy in the right place for a move that was already happening? So this has been the big question on my beat. Uh, Anybody who's worth their salt doing religion and politics reporting has come back to this question again and again, which is how is it that white Christian conservative America came to be some of Trump's most important supporters? And I think there's a lot to break down there. Um, The first place that I always start when I'm thinking about this question is just to always remind myself that even though it seems like a monolith from the polling, you know, there was that infamous stat that went around after 2016 that 81% of white evangelical Protestants voted for Trump, which is huge, 81%. 
even though it seems monolithic with that kind of number, there's still an enormous amount of diversity in those Christians who vote for Trump. Um, there are those who in 2016 and 2020 were the hold your nose Christians who felt like for one issue or another, they were backed into a wall and they just had to vote for Trump because they couldn't bear to cast a vote for Hillary Clinton or for mm -hmm. Biden. There were those who really believe a kind of fear narrative, um, which I think is really potent, especially in those kind of evangelical Protestant circles, but also within certain Catholic subcultures as well, that religious liberty is under attack, that people who have really strong religious beliefs are going to be pushed out of the public square by progressives who have no tolerance for their views. And that really electing a Republican president, even if you might not be someone to your taste, like Trump, is sort of a last bulwark between getting pushed out of the public square and getting to remain a robust part of public life. But then there are also Christians who really love Trump. And I think you can talk about that in a lot of different ways. He certainly has spoken into the uh, issues and viewpoints that are often important to people who are from conservative Christian subcultures. So talking about abortion as a major issue, having someone like Mike Pence, who's very native to those communities be his number two, really focusing on issues like religious liberty uh, rhetorically and in certain ways in terms of policies. And also making a lot of gestures towards that community, even if he did it in ways sometimes that were a little bit bumbling or didn't show fluency, he made these gestures over and over again to say, you're my people and I'm your guy, we're in this together. And I think that's been really powerful um, for some who are part of that world. And the question now is what are they gonna do now that Trump is leaving office? Right, so many questions coming out of what you just said. One, I, I just wanna ask like a, a step back question which is you've been thinking about the evangelical church for a long time. And I have to say, I, I don't think I could give a quick sort of, here's what it is. Here's what I mean when I say evangelical. What do you mean when you use that term? Another great question. Um, so evangelical gets tossed around to mean everything from conservative Protestant to white people, um, to people who are part of a certain set of denominations, you know, Southern Baptist, that kind of thing. Um, I often go to a definition that's a little nerdy and a little, <laughs> it'll so be you'll welcome here. That. Okay. Um, so there's a British scholar, his name is Bevington, who has a quadrilateral, who talks about the four qualities of, um, sort of evangelical experience or the four defining aspects of that. Mm -hmm. Um, one is a, a sort of transformative experience of conversion, this idea that you're born again, or that you're sort of willingly going to Christ. Mm -hmm. Second is the centrality and literality of the biblical story. So believing that what the Bible says is true. Mm -hmm. The third is the story of the crucifixion as being a really essential part of how you understand what it means to be a Christian. So Jesus died on the cross to redeem people from their sins. And that is an essential, crucial piece of the whole, whole cake of doodle. And the final thing is an idea that you have an obligation as a Christian to go out into the world and fulfill what Jesus called the Great Commission, um, this call to sort of spread the good news that he had come and uh, his teachings and to try to bring people into the fold of Christianity. And that, that last piece is what we often associate with evangelicalism because it's very much associated with people evangelizing, going out and sort of reaching to other people and trying to bring them into the fold. Mm -hmm. Sorry, was that too much? I brought- That was great. That was quadrilateral great. is like, you know, one of my bingo card yeah. uh, items. So sure. I'm glad we got to that. Yeah, well, it's also a combination of geometry and theology and that's helpful to put those together. <laughs> it also seems, I mean, I, in my head, as you were naming those four, I was thinking, huh, I wonder how many people I know check off all four, or is it that one or two of those are especially decisive? And then I started thinking uh, about specific examples. Like right now I'm thinking about, for example, the tension around whether congregations can gather in person or not on Sunday mornings and how it is that, uh, 
the congregations that might meet three or four of the sides of that quadrilateral might come up and say, it is better, somehow it is better that we be able to gather. Like what is the voice that is informing that stance this, that we're gonna get together, uh, public health takes a second or third or fourth or becomes an attack on what we're trying to do. Can you explain something like that to yourself, let alone to other people, how that becomes a position that people don't just hold, but hold vociferously? Yeah. I did some reporting on this, especially towards the beginning of the pandemic when it really wasn't clear what was going to happen um, when these groups started meeting. Um, and I should first offer the caveat, which I think is important, which is even within this world of conservative Christianity, um, evangelical Protestantism, the vast majority of churches have closed or have been meeting in person on a limited basis or have done Zoom. You know, several uh, preachers have cracked the joke to me that everyone's a televangelist now uh, because everyone's doing Zoom services. So mm -hmm. I do think it's important to offer that caveat. Um, but certainly, as we've seen, there are a number of churches and some really prominent, big mega churches that have gone the other way, that um, either shut down and stayed closed for a very short period, um, or who refused to shut down at all and continued to worship in person throughout the pandemic. And um, so I do think you can rally some theology to try to make an argument for that, maybe, which is it's an important part of their understanding of what it means to worship God, to be together as a body and praying. And it's not enough to just do that from your couch or your bed and look at your TV screen, that it really is an important and secret act to all be together in person. Um, I think a lot of people would say that generally. Um, but you know, that balancing question, the question of whether it's wise or prudent to balance that need and imperative against having some sort of adaptation or closure because of COVID, I think it's also informed by other cultural aspects. And again, here we're getting into the mingling of politics and religion. Sure. Um, I think that within certain parts of this world, um, there is skepticism of science, skepticism of public health authorities, certainly skepticism of government. Um, the way that government might tell people what to do or curtail people's freedoms in any way, shape, or form. Um, I also think that there was a kind of moment early in the pandemic when it wasn't clear yet right. how the politics were going to play. Right. It wasn't clear yet that this was going to be a Republicans deny this, Democrats say that, you know, lockdowns are necessary, which is, you know, again, that's sort of overly general, but it wasn't clear that, for example, President Trump was going to try to push for reopenings of churches very quickly um, into the spring season of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think those kinds of cues from national political leaders quickly coalesced into a kind of politicization of COVID. And I think that very much informed the way that church leaders were thinking about this issue. Yeah. Um... So again, lots in what you said. One thing you, you said was something about who's going to tell them what to do. And so I've, I've, I guess I'm hearing in a few of these comments, a kind of whether it's formal or informal hierarchical structure of much of the, at least the evangelical church we're talking about here, and admittedly it's over general. But I'm wondering about that, about the extent to which you feel like uh, the majority of people that identify as evangelical are following what the leaders are laying down mm. or, or that it's more democratic. I think I'm asking something about uh, authoritative voice coming from above. And if that's more a part of the uh, religious culture than it is what we think of as democratic culture or how that works as you see it. Hmm. You know, I'd, I'd answer that by tossing out another kind of nerdy riff, um, if that's still welcome here. After sure, sure. Saga. A parallelogram, um, maybe yours. <laughs> that's right, as long as it's all geometric. Yeah. Um, 
You know, I've talked to a lot of pastors about this question, both with COVID, but also with Trump. And a lot, I hear from pastors a lot about what some people have called to me, the Fox News discipleship problem. Okay. Uh, What I mean by that is people taking their cues on what it means to be Christian, what the right thing is to do, what your value should be, not from the pastor on Sunday morning, but um, Fox News, maybe from Newsmax, maybe from OAN now, Mm -hmm. um, certainly from President Trump, imbibing from the water those political messages about who we are and then sort of porting in that religious nationalist frame to it. Um, This is something I hear from pastors who are not, you know, in any way liberal, Mm -hmm. who really are concerned that they are not the guides for how the people under their care are thinking about their religious life. And that those who have the biggest platforms often aren't part of a formal structure that involves training and accountability or hierarchy. Um, You know, all of that is sort of built into the wisdom of how many churches or religious organizations are set up. This idea that you have sort of layers that can check each other and there are ways that you have to acquire knowledge in order to have that authority to teach people or to instruct people. Um, You know, that kind of decentralizing of how people suck in their information is, I think, the story in all aspects of American life when you're talking about how we pick up signals about who we should be. And that's very true within this world as well. Decentralizing, but it sounds also like centralizing. I mean, that's, I guess, what's curious about it is how it is that, let's say the outgoing president becomes the voice that dictates deep, deep attachments and lots of behavior for a huge swath of the population in ways that I assume six years ago would have been very, very hard to predict. Yeah, I think that's a great observation. Um, one of the pet, one of my pet topics, one of the things I like to write about, um, more on the politics side, but very much involves some of these religious aspects, is the nationalization of American politics, mm. the way that the national conversation in Washington about the House and the Senate, but especially about the presidency, has sort of sucked the oxygen out of the room for Mm -hmm. conversations about politics, about in any other form, talking about state houses, talking about local school boards, talking about water boards, you know, the kinds of civic activity that really make people's lives run Mm -hmm. often aren't located that far from your house. They're often, you know, the local town council that convenes every other Wednesday and has really boring, you know, awful meetings, but ultimately on their agenda are the things that are going to change people's everyday lives. But I think one of the reasons, you know, we could talk a lot about why that's happened, but I think one of the reasons is this aspect of tribe and identity that politics has come to represent. The idea that our votes are not just who we want in office to enact policies on healthcare or on climate change, but a reflection of who we are. It's a sort of expression of self. And the fact that our national politics, especially under President Trump, have become so chaotic and dramatic and intense, I think has only hyped up that sense of identity that when we're talking about politics and political activity, it's really what's your relationship to Trump, what's your relationship to who you're going to vote for president. So I do think that centralization is definitely there. It's kind of an amazing, I mean, it's an amazing achievement to have people identify so strongly with a a political figure. Mm. Uh, It's it's a national political figure. Uh, And it it happened with Obama to some degree, but I would say not, not even close to the same degree where in a weird way, I was just thinking about what you said about the self. And I was thinking about the importance of words and ideas like conscience. Mm. Um, And it's been confusing, just speaking for myself, it's been confusing. I think of religion as in a way giving us the language of conscience Mm. and bringing the language of conscience to the public sphere. 
so that there's a kind of, so that you can make our, this again is King, I think, letter from Birmingham jail or something like you got these two kinds of laws. You got the laws of men and the laws of God. And there are times when we need to leave the laws of men behind because they don't live up to the laws of God. Mm-hmm. Which to me is also, it's an argument about conscience. That's how we know, but it feels like there's been this, it's hard to see like, where is conscience now? Is that too abstract and crazy a question to ask? Like, wh- where do you where do you find conscience when you look around at what you're what you're writing about these days? Wow, it's such a big question, and what I hear in that question is a kind of hunger for figures of leadership who are figures of leadership in American politics elected officials, but also other figures of leadership, Mm -hmm. drawing on a way of talking about values and who they are and how they're making choices. That's not about these kind of petty politics of man, which maybe wasn't a category in the letter from Birmingham jail, but you know, the petty politics of man are definitely animating how we do life these days. Petty or worse, yeah. Surely, surely. Um, And I think that's just an extraordinary question because it does really strike at the heart of this partisan identity that we've been talking about that's overtaken everything. And, you know, I'll confess here that partially my vision is limited because I spend all day immersed in this, Mm -hmm. watching Twitter, Mm -hmm. making phone calls, going to visit people who are very much enmeshed in politics and religion and religion and politics and where those things meet. And so my brain also is just full of that. And someone stepping outside of that frame and sort of making an act of conscience that isn't about following those petty laws of man, to me seems rare. Um, You know, I wonder because, and this is where I get to be a reporter rather than a a sort of knowing person, which I... I don't like being a knowing person. I actually really love being the reporter. Um, You know, I I really wonder if we're gonna see in this sort of coming era, a turning away from politics or Mm -hmm. a reinvesting in aspects of life that aren't political. Because I do think that for a lot of Americans, um, you know, especially people who are sort of hyper-engaged, hyper-educated, politics has just been all consuming. Mm Um, for the news. It's been all consuming for just sort of taking up oxygen in Americans mental uh, capacity space. And I wonder if we're going to have a sort of turning towards local communal life turning towards, um, you know, in the in the wake of the pandemic, a sort of reinvestment in communal infrastructure and meeting in together in person. Um, I often wonder whether Um, one of the lessons of this era for people is going to be to turn towards local politics and to get involved on a local level, which is maybe uh, fraught in its own way, but less hyped up around those kinds of national partisan identities. And that's something for me that's a really exciting question as a reporter, looking for that flowering that comes in the aftermath of such a really chaotic time. And you, you, actually, it's reminding me of a piece you wrote about uh, community is it in St. Mary's or St. Maris? Is that the name of the yeah. uh-huh. St. Mary's? Where clear, huge investment in local community, shared faith, shared values. And so, what's interesting is thinking like the pluses of the focus on the local and the shared are qu- quite clear. And then the word you've used pluralism a couple of times is the, the sort of thing I'm wondering about. What happens to pluralism if there's a real focus on the local, especially if it's the local and like? Mm. Oh, this is the great question. Um, I'm obsessed with this question. So just to recap uh, the story that I wrote about St. Mary's, Kansas, um, there is a community there. St. Mary's is a dot on the map, literally in the middle of Kansas, which is basically literally in the middle of the country. Um, Very small town that's about an hour-ish from the nearest city. And what happened there was that it had always been a Catholic town, 
But in the late 1970s, a group of priests who were part of an order that had um, not quite schismed, but sort of separated itself from the Catholic Church, um, sort of hyper conservative and traditionalist, settled down there and bought an old Jesuit seminary and sort of moved to town. And it's a group that is very traditionalist Catholic. They, you know, celebrate Mass in Latin. Um, they tend to follow the precepts of the Catholic Church, which teach, you know, you shouldn't use birth control. So they have really big families and both through natural population growth, but also through people moving across the country to come and settle down there. The population of St. Mary's has tripled essentially in the surrounding areas because of this religious order, um, the Society of St. Pius X, over the last 40 or so years. And so what I went to try to understand was what was the kind of richness of having this community where people really had thick connections, they had something that they shared that they believed in, they had a school that they were mutually invested in, but they also had a sense of neighborliness, right, yeah. an obligation to one another in neighborliness that I think is somewhat rare in American life today. Um, but to also understand where the tensions lay around that. And one of the things I found is that they had mostly taken over the governance in the little town. Um, they had elected their state rep from that area and they had kind of crowded out any kind of civic life from the people who were there before in St. Mary's who also thought about themselves as St. Mary's residents but were no longer in the majority. So, you know, that little story um, to me is really, really powerful yeah. because on the one hand, I think there's a real case to be made that, you know, St. Mary's is certainly not for everyone in America. A lot of people would not want to go there. A lot of American Catholics would not want to go and live like that. Yeah. But, you know, there's an argument to be made that if we all had our little St. Mary's, maybe we wouldn't care so much about national politics and who's becoming president and trying to win over the entire culture in our image to dominate it. Right. If we had local communities of concern that were really robust and felt like that was the place to really invest, um, you know, I, I think that can be really fulsome for people. And I think there's a real question here about the role that exposure to difference and others uh, plays as a value in American life, uh, helping us build the habit of being in strong disagreement, but respectful disagreement with people who are different from us. And certainly I think there's a lot of danger too in these models of sort of battening down the hatches with people who are like you because often that involves racial politics of reinforcing the whiteness of a certain type of community and excluding people of color. Um, often it can either feed from or grow a certain type of grievance politics, um, which I think can be really potent and feed right back into that culture war. Um, and, you know, I'm sort of setting that aside from the St. Mary's example, but um, I, I think this is a really tough question, yeah. um, but certainly I think those experiments are worth looking at because they're provocative um, for this moment that we're at in American life. Sure, and the, the hope for more uh, robust and connected sense of local community, I think I, uh, people seem to be hungering for that in so many ways, and it's only exaggerated by the fact that we can't even get together with our neighbors in many contexts. Um, right. But it was true even before that, that the big sort you were talking about before, um, it's harder to have that, like you get a sense of red and blue when you look back at those fancy maps that the guys on TV like to move around. But when you actually get in there, if you're, if you're actually interacting with people, you, you usually meet folks from, that complicate that, unless it's the kind of community that you're writing about in St. Mary's where it is pretty, it, it's more homogenous. Um, I guess I'm thinking about the local again. Um, have you seen, here's, here's the question in my head. Do you think that uh, community religious organizations, houses of worship, churches, mosques, synagogues, tend to uh, feed the kind of connection across difference that you just talked about wanting to see, or do they tend to go in the other direction and sort of take the, take the nutrition out of that? I think it's a really powerful question. And I would say that I've seen examples of both 
in my reporting in really extreme ways. Um, so I'll, I'll give you two different examples. Um, the first is a, a piece that I wrote and I'm just really grateful that you're giving me a chance to air all of my nerdiest aspects this evening. Um, but it was a piece that I wrote about zoning laws, which stick with me. I know people are going to sleep, but- No, um, Portland, people don't get more excited than about zoning laws. So you're in good, yeah, I it's good, at least for the point. Oh, this is great. Yeah. Um, so believe it or not, zoning law is actually one of the most contentious areas for religious liberty fights in the country. Um, the Department of Justice, when it brings suits around religious liberty violations, like huge proportion of those are brought under a federal statute mm. that's explicitly about zoning law. Mm. Um, and there's a complicated reason why that is, it's sort of irrelevant to this story here. But in any case, I was writing this story about religion and zoning law. And I encountered this church in New Jersey, which had moved around from place to place to place. It had finally found this warehouse to buy to be its home. And one of the reasons why I bought that warehouse is because of this question it was trying really self-consciously to mm. be at a crossroads of a couple different interstates Got so it. that they could have people who were from the Latino area that they were close to, who were from the wealthier, whiter part of the area and have the sort of working class people who would commute in and have them all be sort of equally accessible on those highways to be able to come to church with them because they felt like that was an enormous value to their community. And, you know, I went, I saw them in their worship, it was really diverse racially. They seemed to have people with all sorts of different kinds of dress and clothes. And, you know, long story short, they had a really big, long drawn out zoning battle that made it really, really hard for them to do that. And they were, you know, basically worshiping in this half finished building with like unfinished doorknobs and stuff because mm -hmm. they didn't have enough money because of these zoning fights. But um, the point is that I think there are communities who try against a lot of um, challenges to make that happen. But I bring up the zoning story, not because that was an example of diversity, but because I think it's such a powerful illustration of the way that American life is not set up to have churches be that crossroads of mm -hmm. diversity, those in-houses where people meet, because we're already sorted across lines of class and race. The people who are in neighborhoods that have similar property tax valuations are going to be going to a local church that's all the similar kinds of property tax valuations. Um, there's a lot of sort of built in aspects of American life that make it really hard for religious groups to reflect that kind of diversity. So um, yes and no in radically interesting ways would be mm -hmm. my answer to your question. Yeah, it's interesting because it does seem like if you, if you just, the more we've learned about the the people gathered in DC on the 6th, uh, it didn't look like a great deal of racial diversity. I'm, I'm understating. I mean, that was a very white crowd, but on the economic level, there was actually quite a bit of variety. Um, so it is interesting thinking about, it's true, of course, that there are many things that don't, that aren't conducive to uh, connecting across difference. But it would seem like actually the church, along with probably the military and some schools, is one of the best, most uh, far-reaching networks we could count on to do it. And so then I guess to me the question is, is the intent there? And you gave a really nice example of this one church in New Jersey. Um, do you, have you run into churches that say, come to our place three Sundays a month and the fourth Sunday go to someone else's. You ever run into something, anything like that? Oh, that's a terrific idea. I'm not sure if I've seen anything like that. Although certainly a lot of religious groups, not just Christian groups have really robust partnerships with mm -hmm. either other churches or other religious groups. Um, so this is a, a sort of different example, but um, I did a lot of reporting in Pittsburgh after the 2018 synagogue shooting there. And one of the themes that came up in my reporting after that was the really robust relationship that a lot of the synagogues had and continued to develop with black churches mm -hmm. after the shooting, because there was this awareness that there was some commonality there, but there hadn't ever really been an effort to mm -hmm. invest in that or build those relationships. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's a pretty extraordinary example, but I do think there are groups across America that are trying to do things like that to build partnerships and create an opportunity for 
religious observance to actually be a pathway to going and seeing something that's radically different from your own thing and to build relationships with people who are not like you. Yeah, that actually reminds me, sort of coming back to the day, today and yesterday and tomorrow, I saw that uh, soon to be President Biden invited congressional leaders from both sides of the aisle to attend church with him tomorrow morning. Uh, what do you make of that gesture? And what do, you, what do you think the meaning of that is, if it has any? I think that's classic Biden. Um, I think that he campaigned on the message of unity, and he often did that explicitly tapping into his faith background and identity and religious language. And I think that he wants to start off at least being a guy who seems like he's reaching out to both sides. I also think we're at this moment where in an unprecedented and very unusual way, there's maybe more will than usual by mm. political leaders who otherwise would swear themselves to be lifelong enemies to come together and try to have at least ceremonial shows of unity. I'm thinking right now of Chuck Schumer and mm -hmm. Mitch McConnell, mm -hmm. um, the senators sort of vying for leadership of the Senate, moving from Mitch McConnell to Chuck Schumer. Um, you know, those are two people who are never gonna have a kumbaya, hold hands, sing and praise God session together. That's just never gonna happen. Um, but they're both on the list to go and um, be part of that mass with Biden. and. So I, I do wonder if that's something he's going to continue or that's a spirit that will reign outside of this very particular and extraordinary moment that we're living through. Yeah, I want to, I guess I want to move us toward a close by thinking not about our leaders, uh, but about us. Um, as you've paid attention, and when I say us, I mean, those of us that aren't, uh, whose choice to go to church or synagogue or a mosque, it's not broadcast on TV. This is how we either do or don't live our lives. And I guess I want to ask, as you've studied this stuff, written about it, learned about it, immersed yourself in it, both here and in other countries, I should say, um, like, are you feeling hopeful about the relationship between religious observance and democracy right now for most of us, not based on what the leaders are doing, but the way we're living our lives? Too big a question, but as we're getting close to the hour, I want to ask it to you anyway. I, I think it's a really good one. And I actually um, have in mind a comment that you were making earlier about that observation of the people who decided to show up to the Capitol and protest mm. the of the 2020 election and did so under the banner of their faith. Um, you know, one of the observations you made was that there was actually a lot of diversity in that crowd, not racially, but you know, there's everybody from the real estate salesmen to um, the sort of working class Trump voter stereotype, um, a lot of range of people who wouldn't necessarily be in groups or rooms together are coming together. And I think there's a powerful lesson from that, which mm -hmm. is I think this moment that we're in is full of abstraction. It often happens on social media or in the province of television news, cable news, MSNBC or Fox News, or you know, some that are even more out there on the conservative side. These ideas that we have about who we are and what's happening are often not grounded in fact or actual tangible relationships. And they're often not built on this idea of mutual responsibility built over time. And I think that's a really important factor here that there were all these people coming together, but it wasn't really like one church was going to dem demonstrate the Jericho March, right? It's a lot of different kinds of people who are united largely in believing conspiracy theories that are spread on the internet. And so the thing about religion that I think can be so powerful as a frame, even for people who don't want to be part of a church or a synagogue or a mosque, who don't believe in God or a higher power, don't want to spend their Saturday or Sunday doing that, um, I think there's a lesson there that's still sort of universal or, or useful, which is having actual relationships with real human beings who are your neighbors or at least live kind of close to you, who can engage with you in ways that are not about partisan politics, who can walk through the moments of life that really form us, which are, by the way, not really political events. They're 
births and deaths and weddings mm -hmm. and illnesses and celebrations of victories in work and whatever that that's the stuff of life and the stuff of community. And I think ultimately it's grounding because when you have those kind of relationships with real human beings, it's much, much harder to look at someone and accuse them of being, you know, a pedophile uh, based on a conspiracy theory that you saw on the internet, mm -hmm. right? It's much harder to accuse them of sort of nefarious acts or subscribing to a really extreme political ideology that you've come to sort of see as a caricature of the other side. And so in that way, I do find hope, especially as we are looking to a post-pandemic moment, because um, I hope that we will turn back to that mm -hmm. instinct in American mm -hmm. life, which is religious, but also beyond religious, it's civic. Um, this is the stuff of our civic life. And, and I, I'm very excited to get back to writing about people doing that kind of life. Yeah, and I, I want to take this moment to say thank you for the writing you've been doing. It's interesting, I, I mean, knowing that you were coming in for this by Zoom, I, I got to read back many years and you've been paying attention to our civic life and the ways we connect, how we think about our connection. And it's, uh, it's both illuminating and it is to me also in many ways hopeful. And um, the post pandemic moment and even the rest of this pandemic moment, I think more of that kind of thinking about how we show up next to each other and with each other, enormously important. I wanna do a little segue based on that and say, we're about to sign off. And when we do, I hope people that have been watching will come back in on the Zoom that should be just below the video so that you can talk to some people you don't know about what you think and why it matters to you. Uh, and even more important than talk to people you don't know, uh, hear from some people you don't know. Uh, listen to some folks and hear what they think about the relationship between faith and religion and democracy. Um, I also want to say that in about two weeks, we're going to have David French out here, who also, who is from Tennessee, which I think Tennessee has some matters for you. Uh, David French has a, a recent book, Divided We Fall, and he's a really good thinker about division and connection, and also, I think, about faith and politics. Um, and after David French, two weeks after that will be Hari Han, who thinks a lot about democratic engagement coming out of a center with Johns Hopkins called the Agora Institute. So lots of ways of thinking about how we get together in local communities and how that relates to what's going on on the national and political level. Uh, for right now, Emma, I just wanna say again, a huge thanks for the work you've been doing and for the conversation we just had tonight. Really, really appreciate it. This was just such a treat. And the only way it could be more fun is if I was able to hang out with all of you all in Portland in physical form. And I regret that we can't, but maybe one day. Down and, the road. you know, for now, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation. Great. Thanks. And we'll look forward to that conversation down the road. Thanks again so much. And everybody, please, uh, please call in and check in and let us know what you thought of the program too, if you'd like to communicate that way. So I'm going to hand it back to Ben behind the scenes and Roselle Medina, my colleague to facilitate the conversation.